You know what? Even though it's in black and white, it's fucking crazy, man, you know? What's Clerks? It was one of the funniest movies I ever saw. I cracked up so hard. Dude, you gotta see this film. It's like this black and white movie, but it's just all talking, but it's really fun. Awesome. It's the first film that really speaks to uh, the 90s generation. Oh yeah, that's in Dialogue, dialogue's good too. Uh, fucking Randall's like the guy everybody wants to be. If you like street hockey, you'll like the movie. I think the first time I rented it, I saw it five times that night. I watched it, you know, maybe a hundred times since then at least. You gotta see. So if there's a flagpole, he grabs it and he sucks it off. Grabs a phone receiver and he's sucking it off. Grabs a pool stick and he's fucking sucking it off. And me and Walter are just like watching him go from place to place in the room. He was just doing it to amuse himself. Hey, you cock smoking clerk. We used to go to the mall a lot. For some reason, we're walking through the mall and I snatched a wig off one of the mannequins and it, it matched Walt's hair, but we ended up putting it on him backwards. And from then on, we presented him for the rest of the time we were at the mall as, I think it was Kevin's cousin or maybe my cousin from Russia, and his name was Olaf. He's your cousin? Yeah, and he's from Russia too. No way. What part of Russia? Oh, fucking no, don't I look like a fucking biographer. So the idea is he's like a Russian rock star. He wants to be a metal singer. No way. I swear, Olaf, metal. Walter would try to pretend he was speaking in Russian and do things like this, meaning he wanted to kiss. Olaf, girl, nice. Skrullnik. And Walt would make up fake Russian words and would be like, I think he wants to kiss you and stuff. Would you like to suck my cock, Belzapa? That's beautiful, man. He, at that time, was just sort of floating along, not really sure what he wanted to do. Because we came from the same place of graduating high school and not going on to a four-year school like you're supposed to. You do one of two things in our town. You go into the four-year school, which is really the minority, or the majority, which is you go and get a job in construction or plumbing. First job was at Long John's as a busboy, and that's the first convenience store I ever worked at. Was that in-between stage in his life with, what am I going to do? for the rest of my life. What should, do I want to do? I worked at an Italian bakery, which sucked because I can't stand Italian desserts. If you stay at a job longer than a year, it becomes a career, doesn't it? That was when I did that summer of going through some shitty, terrible jobs. At one point, I was digging graves. I worked at the cemetery. Domino's Pizza, worked there for a day. The day that Batman came out, quit so I can go see Batman with Walt and Bry. Kevin didn't have a car, and he came over to the house, and he said, I'm going to go for a job interview. Can I borrow your car? He came back, he had gotten a job, uh, and it was at RST Video and Quick Stop. I was interested in working in the video store because that seemed like a dream job, sitting around watching fucking movies all day long, getting free rentals. And Kevin got me a job at RST and Quick Stop. And we pretty much had the run of the place. It was like, it was essentially a clubhouse where a bunch of uninvited people would come in and, and bother you to buy things. Our time there was not really spent working as much as it was spent trying not to work. I was confrontational. I spent a lot of time making fun of the customers. You know what I can do with that? I can do with that to people in the video store. Which ones? All of them. Mock them to their face, like if they used a double negative, I'd correct their English. I don't think your manager would appreciate it. I don't appreciate it. your ruse, man. If a customer was going to come in and I was going to be rude to them and I knew it was going to make Kevin laugh, it's like, that's what I was going to do. Johnson had a fantastic sense of humor, sharpest fucking wit in the galaxy. So Randall is very much Brian. Then quit. You should be going to school anyway. <laughs> that was something that I got quite a bit of at that time in my life. Didn't have a great collegiate career. Didn't know what I wanted to do. Was content to work in the stores because it was easy and I was lazy. So, you know, I was kind of the prototypical Dante. But the guy I always wanted to be was Brian Johnson. Who the fuck is this guy to spend time? My boy. I first got a job at um, the Quick Stop convenience store when I was um, a junior in high school. You know, I brought a, a TV over to Quick Stop and um, I was watching uh, Twin Peaks. I asked him if he was a fan of Twin Peaks because at the time Twin Peaks was on TV and I was a huge fan of it and David Lynch and Kevin said yeah. We immediately struck up conversation about David Lynch and, and film and it became 
abundantly clear that Vinny was a film fanatic. Initially, it was just talking, and then and then it was me trying to convert him into realizing that movies needed to be seen a certain way. And he bought a laser disc player, and we started seeing ads for all these what looked like very interesting independent films playing in New York City. And these were films that didn't come to theaters around here. You know, at 10:30, we'd lock up the quick stop and then drive up to the Angelica and go to a midnight movie. <laughs> Kevin did exist on a diet of, of mainstream movies, and when he met Vincent, they went to see their funny little pictures or little independent movies together. The moment that changed Kevin's life was when we went up to see Slacker. And that was the night that I was just like, it all clicked. Do you ever have those dreams that are just completely real? I mean, they're so vivid, it's just like completely real. That was the first really micro-budget film that Kevin looked at. When that movie let out, there was just a completely different look in Kevin's eyes. Slacker was the movie that really made me want to become a filmmaker. Uh, made it seem possible. Like, I can do something on a low-budget shoestring. We didn't really say much to each other as we were driving home, and then suddenly Kevin started talking about, you know, I can do that. For the first time I was talking about making a film. He's like, you know, I, I, could, I, I could come up with like $30,000 and, and make a film. And from that moment on, it was like full speed ahead for him. It was kind of like out of nowhere, he just said, I'm going to go to film school, and I'm going to make a movie. When I come back, I'm going to make a movie. And it was kind of like, okay. I was surprised that he wasn't like, hey, you want to go to film school too? Because we had done everything together up to that point. Again, the trusty old village voice. He came across an ad for the Vancouver Film School. I didn't want to go to a four-year film school, but this was an eight-month program for nine grand. Eight months, you're in and out. And Kevin looked at that and he's like, I can have a complete film school education and come back and, and make my little independent film. I figured if I could learn how to operate a camera at film school and learn how to operate a Niagara, I can come home and teach Bri how to operate something and Walt how to operate something, Ed how to operate something, we'd be off and running. When he applied, I said, you know, that's the expense, Kev. What are we going to do? So he, he said, I'll sell my CD collection. I'll sell comic books if I have to. I got the application, applied to the Vancouver Film School, sent in my check, and then got an acceptance letter. I mean, it was like teary. It was like I was upset that he was leaving. I didn't want him to leave. He eventually went to the school in 92, and it's a good thing he did because when he went there, he met Scott Mosier, who's been his partner in crime ever since. <laughs> written that Kevin and I were two guys from New Jersey who had made this movie in this convenience store, but I am actually, I was born in Washington State, where we are right now. My first interaction with Kevin was, we were in a classroom, and I thought he was kind of a smart ass, he was wearing that trench coat, I was sort of like, who the fuck is this guy? First time I saw Mosier was on the orientation day, and I was like, what a pretty boy. Because he looked like a 90210 kid. Product in his hair. I had just came from LA, and so I was like, I was, I was pretty much, gay. I looked, yeah, I was gay. And then he started talking to Scott, and he realized that Scott was actually like a really on the ball cool guy. I remember we got called into the office because we were talking in class. It was sort of us solidifying our relationship by what we had in common, which was a disdain for authority, I guess. I pretty much, Mosher and I pretty much bonded, I believe, over a very common sense of humor. You know, which we still do. Jedi or the Empire Strikes Back? Empire. Blasphemy. The Star Wars scene came from us sitting downstairs at the cafe at the VFS, and him and I were sitting there talking about Star Wars. All, all Jedi had was a bunch of Muppets. And there was a dude who was sitting next to us who was listening to our conversation. And I nudged Mosier and be like, that dude's listening. <laughs> so we started upping the ante of our conversation and taking it to ridiculous places. So a construction job of that magnitude would require a hell of a lot more manpower than the Imperial Army had to offer. I bet they brought independent contractors in on that thing. Kevin had come up with this idea of doing a doc about this pre-op transsexual named Melda May. All we really wanted to do was to get picked. We just wanted to win the pitch. Because as soon as we pitched and as soon as we won, neither of us wanted to do it. And so we went to the transvestite ball. We shot one night with her and then she disappeared. So we were fucked. We had no, we had no subject, so we couldn't make a documentary. So why not make a documentary about how ours fell apart? It was the greatest documentary that never happened. Well, she was a man. But becoming a woman. Exactly. And me and him play characters in the documentary. 
we'd had scripted lines. So after we spent weeks of nurturing and building our ideal documentary, it crumbled in the middle of production. And we, we basically said, we're going to interview each of the crew members, and, they, and you guys can say whatever you want. You can call us assholes, you can call us incompetent. Be totally honest. They felt free to do it. Hey, there's the six Ps. Which I think is like Seven. nine Ps, but whatever. <laughs> poor planning produces piss poor production. The directors didn't seem interested in organization. To my knowledge, the first time that a documentary has fallen apart in production. Of course, by that time, we were the scandal of the class. Oh, yeah. Like shooting us backlit in kind of that standard two shot, that became my signature setup. I'm the two shot guy, you know, two shot waist up. And you were very adamant at that, at that point, which would follow into Clerks, about sticking to the, to the script, about you, well, about me sticking to the script. And then as soon as he always had the liberty to like, <laughs> he tended to, what he would tend to do is repeat what I said. The thing is, when you're doing a documentary, you have to remember that you're not in control of your environment. That's, that's true, you're not in control of your environment. <laughs> <laughs> that, was my, that was me kind of riffing. And then of course, Kevin ended up leaving halfway through the program anyway. The directors weren't necessarily going to be able to direct their scripts. So he was just like, you know, fuck it, I'll just use the $5,000 that I was going to pay for the second semester as part of the budget for clerks. So I talked to Mojan and I said, look, let's make a deal, like, I'm going to go home and let's both write. If you finish first, I'll come out there and work on your movie. If I finish first, you come back to Jersey work on my movie. It's done. Kevin leaving, I mean, I think I was kind of worried about the second half of school. What happened after he left was Dave Klein and I started hanging out quite a bit. I was 19 when I ended up at the Vancouver Film School. My first collaboration with Mosier was uh, the short Will and Black that I shot and he cut. After Will and Black was graduation and I moved to Seattle, I was trying to find work as a camera assistant. I mean, the importance of that time, those four months with Kevin, we're two, and then my time with Dave created the third. So I went home and started writing feverishly because I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a movie set in a convenience store. And it wasn't until I went to film school that I figured out that I wanted to make clerks. Robert Rodriguez had been the story, you know, a year before that, before I went to film school with El Mariachi, and I'd read an interview with Robert where he's like, the <clears throat> best way to go about making your first film is take stock of what you have. And in his interview, he's like, I knew I had access to a bus, I knew I had access to a guitar, and I had a turtle. And he's like, so right away, I knew I was putting those things in my movie. So I was like, well, I got access to a convenience store. And I know that world, because that's all I'd ever really done. So I said, I'm gonna use the convenience store as the backdrop to a movie about people sitting around and talking. In terms of what people were saying in Clerks and how blue people were talking, how it was all about conversation, very frank conversations about sex. After he gets the blowjob, he likes to have it spit back into his mouth while kissing. It's called snowballing. That just came out of real life. It was hanging out with Brian and Ed, it was hanging out with Walter, where I was just like, well, this is how we talk. I wanted to make a movie about me and my friends, essentially, because I hadn't really seen it represented like that. When I got back from film school, I went down to see Mrs. Topper, who ran Quick Stop. And since I knew the story like the back of my hand, they wanted me to come back. And I said, I'm happy to come back, but I want to shoot a movie here. And she was like, oh, go ahead. You know, but fine, of course. So permission granted, I came back to work at the store, and I was off and running with writing clerks. I used to come home from work and stop at the video store. But I remember the one day I came in and he was sitting there on this little Smith Corona word processor that he had just gotten for his birthday and he was writing, writing, writing. He was saying, I'm writing a movie script. And I just remember thinking, a movie script? What are you gonna do with this? Like, <laughs> I just thought like he had like a little home video camera and he's like, yeah, we're gonna make a movie. And I was like, sure, whatever. First draft of Clerks, I think I took about a month to write it. When he first proposed the idea of doing Clerks, the original idea was not a comedy at all. Originally, it was going to be a very David Lynchian film about a guy working the midnight to 6 a.m. shift at a convenience store and all the strange people that came in. When Kevin first handed me a big chunk of pages from Clerks, it was essentially a bunch of random scenes. I mean, he had the characters in there. It was Dante and Randall. And the first scene I wrote was the scene where Randall's sitting on the counter and the customer comes in and he's like, I don't appreciate your ruse, man. I beg your pardon? Your ruse, your cunning attempt to trick me. Vinny was the dude that 
came up with the title. The original title to the movie was a very clever pun on words, and it was called Inconvenience. And Vinny was smart enough to be like, dude, that's a little, that's a little corny, don't you think? I remember saying to him one day, I was like, you should call it Rude Clerks. You know, Rude Clerks is kind of funny, but Clerks is actually not a bad title. By the time the first draft screenplay was done, it was Clerks. Kevin had sent me the script for Clerks, and I thought it was really funny. I didn't know how to budget a movie. I didn't know if it was possible. He had sent me the article from Filmmaker Magazine that Peter Broderick had written about budgets. I thought it'd be really interesting to write an article about three movies that were made for tiny budgets at a time when it was harder and harder for first-time filmmakers to find financing. The great thing was we printed the budgets. And that is kind of what we used. You know, we never had a budget on the movie. We were like, if we spend over 25000 then, then we start to worry. We start to worry. And being that soccer had only cost about $35,000 to make, Kevin figured that he had enough credit that he could make a film on that level just by maxing out his credit cards. You know, I worked five buck an hour job. So, it, it, you know, in retrospect, it was quite a risk. He was selling some of his comic book collection statuettes and everything. And he was just hoping from there that he would have enough money uh, to start. I was in Vancouver and he was in New Jersey. I booked the camera equipment long distance. I would get up at like four in the morning. Mosher became the facilitator in so, on so many different fronts. When it came time to hire a DP, that was, Dave was my idea. Look, here's somebody who can shoot the movie. He doesn't know that much more than us. And you know what, we'll just all sit around and figure it out. And I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But as far as the visuals were concerned, I saw it in color. We were just starting preliminary conversations about shooting in December when this big nor'easter flood flooded the town of Highlands where Kevin lived. Totally wiped out our little town and several towns along the East Coast. The first thing he thought was his comic book collection and his laser disc. His comic book collection was his most precious thing. He just thought that was going to be the end. It was declared a disaster area. He ended up getting a check for like $3,000 from FEMA. And you know, th that went into the budget of clerks. At which time then he announced to me that March 19th, 1993, I am going to start doing clerks and interviewing and taking auditions and everything. And I kind of pleaded with him and said, can we back that up a little bit more? You know, because the house is totally a wreck and it's going to take so much construction time. And that's the date he wanted. That's the date he started. <laughs> Kevin initially wrote Clerks with Ernie O'Donnell as Dante and Kevin Smith as Randall. Dante I'd written for nobody in particular, but the only actor I knew was Ernie, who I'd done all the talent shows with with Belt. Called me at work one day. He goes, I got the script Clerks I'm doing. <laughs> so what the fuck's a clerk? I said, who else is in it? He's like, oh, well, I, want, uh, I want Mike to be in it. I said, well, who's Mike? You know, he's Silent Bob. Yeah. I was like, oh, all right. Perfect, right? <laughs> Perfect, man. Let's do it. So my man Mike's in it. You know, I'm in it. I'm the lead. And like, man, Kev's writing us. All right, everything's getting back together. Like, you know, the old Skamaz troops getting here. Like two weeks later, you did, did your audition? Yeah, he had auditions at the Atlantic Collins Playhouse. Right. One day, Kevin walked in. He was looking for a place to audition for his film and that he needed actors. And we were the right place to come because uh, we have actors. I was doing community theater acting, and the owner of the theater had contacted me saying, like, these guys are doing some sort of film, and they're auditioning, you know, I think you should come down. I was like, oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. I had done quite a bit of community theater, and through the grapevine, found out about the auditions. I came into the place, and Kevin was there, Vincent Pereira was there, I think Ed was there. He let them do a dramatic monologue of their choice. Marilyn Gigliotti. For my audition, I used just a monologue out of a monologue book, but something that I really connected with. I open my eyes, and I find I'm living in this world where nobody hears me and, and nobody sees me. We were all flabbergasted because she cried. And we were like, that's fucked up. How can somebody do that, man? she just cry like that. That's, that's amazing, what an actress, you know? So we were already leaning toward her as, as Veronica. Who's leading this mob? Jeff Anderson came in 
with no intention of reading. He came in as a friend, basically, just to sort of hang out. I remember when we heard about the auditions, it was like, whoa, there's gonna be hot actor chicks there? Let's go check this out. He was like, hey, you know, Kev, as a joke, can I get up here and do some of these this uh, this J stuff? In high school, I never acted, never was in plays, never wanted to do any of that stuff. Not in me, she says. That's what she says. Silver, I get hot, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little nervous now, you made me nervous. The whole thing is a blur and it was probably a horrible audition. <laughs> I fucking hate jerking off when I ain't got a jerk off, you know what I mean? So I take it out, I blow a nut on her belly, you know? And I'm out of there. Just as my uncle <laughs> comes walking in, it was so fucking close to all. Hey man, I don't care if she's my cousin, I'm getting her again tonight. <laughs> And he was really, really funny. But it didn't dawn on anybody at that point that Jeff would be a good Randall. You know, at that point I was going to play Randall. And then as I got close to production, I'm like, I can't memorize all this dialogue. I'm not an actor. What am I thinking? I'm going to get somebody else to do it. And Kevin was like, you know what? I've been thinking. What do you think of Jeff Anderson for Randall? I called him up and I was like, dude, I want to read the, through the script with you. Page by page went through, I think, the entire script and read it. And at the end of it, I was like, I think you're it, dude. You're, you're Randall. And I remember like trying to talk him out of it. I'm like, how much money is this movie going to cost you? And he's like, you know, thousands of dollars. And I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm out. I, I'm not, you're not spending thousands of dollars on the hopes that I remember all these lines. It's just not going to happen. I had been involved in another show at the time. And apparently the first night of auditions had gone by. And I just completely forgot. So I hadn't prepared nothing. Well, Susie. I'm gonna lock us in. Brian did an audition with a piece that was 180 from Dante, but you could see that the dude had chops. And I kept telling you that's enough! I don't want to know anymore! But she went on, on, on! And that was it. I went and did my thing and I laughed. I said, Kev, do you want me to read for Dante? You want me to do a character? You want me to do anything? He said, no, no, just, just feed lines. And mind you, Ernie's had the script for a month. Didn't bother to memorize the script, which was a little irksome. People only get a paper. Uh, people only get the paper of coffee this time of morning. He didn't know the part. He had the script, this telephone book, for three months, and he's up on stage and stumbling through it. Theoretically, people see money on the counter, nobody around, uh, and nobody around. They think they're being watched. But that wasn't so much of a problem. The problem was that Ernie's read of the character was not the character. Dante was a schlub. He's an everyman, he's Charlie Brown. And he sounded like his performance of Danny Zuko in Greece. You can't get enough of me. So I'm sitting there listening to his read, getting a kind of sinking feeling because now this is the guy who's my lead. And then Vinny and Walter address the pink elephant in the room, which is, dude, are you sure you want to cast Ernie as Dante? And he's like, I'm having doubts about Ernie. I'm like, about time. I've had doubts about Ernie since that first time I saw him up on stage. He doesn't know the part. And uh, Kevin was like, ooh, you see that too? I'm like, Ray Charles could see that. Kevin calls me up and he goes, oh, I said, how's everything going? Oh, great, great, great. I got everything filled up. He said, we got a couple changes though. Mike's not going to be Silent Bob anymore. I said, why not? He goes, oh, I, I think I'm going to be Silent Bob. When I decided to beg off of playing Randall and cast Jeff Anderson and said, um, I was like, well, I want to be in this movie, too. You know what? I'm taking Silent Bob role. Never mind, Mike. I said, all right, so what's the other change? And he goes, oh, the other change is you're not Dante. I was like, what? I said, yeah, but you wrote the part for me, you prick. Yeah. I said, what the fuck's going <laughs> really, on? Really, if you wrote it, yeah. He's like, no, I got a great part for you. It's perfect. <laughs> I said, what the fucking part am I get? You're Rick Derris. I said, who the fuck is Rick Derris? I'm a trainer. I know what that sound signifies. You're out of shape. Kevin told me that Ben Affleck told him that Rick Darrow be one of his favorite characters in Quartz. Everything happens for a reason. That's right. This was really about the right man for the role. And Brian O'Halloran was definitely the right man for the role. I'm not even supposed to be here today! Kevin actually called me back and he wanted me to come down to the convenience store and actually read the script and see if maybe I'd be interested because of certain topics of conversation. I was like, my God, there's about 70 curses on every page. You know how much money the average jizz mopper makes per hour? When I first read it, you know, I, it was kind of shocking to see it in print form as an actual film. You're so repressed. Because I never tried to suck my own dick? I just remember actually reading um, just my scene. 
be the infamous scene of the snowballing. After he gets the blowjob, he likes to have it spit back into his mouth while kissing. It's called snowballing. I'm, I'm, I'll admit, I was taken aback. I... <laughs> wait, wait, what is that anyway? Something like 36. Does that include me? Um, 37. And that whole 37 thing? You know what? I just consider it my catchphrase. Arnold has his, Tom Cruise has his, it's, you know, that doesn't really bother me because I know what it was. Uh, just as long as the other person realizes, like, hey, tag is acting. When we were rehearsing for the film, we rehearsed in the video store and the convenience store. Every night from like 10.30 till midnight or one in the morning. And that went on for a good month. And we would just run the scenes over and over and over again and kind of block and stuff like that. I mean, even back then, Kevin was very precise about the words and the pronunciations of things as well. There is never any ad-libbing <laughs> for Kevin's scripts. Every time we rehearsed afterward, it would be kind of open up for discussion. And I remember Marilyn saying, I've got one. Kevin, okay, the floor is yours. She said, he's not going to be able to pull this off, like to me. And I just remember being like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Something along the lines to Jeff, I don't have any confidence in his ability to do this. And Kevin was like, what do you mean? She said, well, he's never acted before. He seems kind of nervous. and..." I just don't think he's good for it, and I don't think he's going to be able to pull it off. And that's something that you don't do, you know, uh, to someone who's already nervous to begin with. Um, God, I have no memory of that whatsoever. It would be so out of character for me to actually say something out loud like that. And so that pushed Jeff to the point of like, well, the hell with this, you know, I, I really can't. And that just shattered his confidence to do it whatsoever. And I handed him the telephone book script back, and I said, dude, I'm out of this. I said, what, why, why? I, I love what you're doing. I think it's awesome, so don't worry about that shit. So he tucked me into staying and was like, no, really, you have to stay, and blah, 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 blah. I, I don't think I would have said that. It's like, shame on me if I did. There was some tension there, and, um, and rehearsals kind of fell apart at that point. Dave and I arrived there three to four weeks ahead of time. We had a plan. I knew exactly what we needed to do once we got there, which is buy the film, get the sound equipment and lights and stuff like that. Kevin was working the store, so that was kind of the central office. We scouted the, the quick stop. We looked at the other few locations we had. Um, actually, Ed Hapstack and I built a couple of fluorescents. I just chained up some fluorescent lights back there, and then I think we even put some my halogen work lights. Actually, we moved the cigarettes. We took all the cigarettes out from above the counter. The whole cigarette racks were gone, and we were like basically bouncing light off of where the cigarettes would normally be. We got the camera from uh, a place in New York, and it was an old Airflex SR. It sounded like a fucking machine gun. Probably the loudest camera I've ever worked with. I think the look of that movie was mainly decided by the dollar. It was just more cost effective to shoot black and white. This whole issue of color temperature. You've got fluorescence, but we've also got windows to deal with. If we shot in black and white, that was no longer something we'd even have to think about. And then we can use the, the tungsten lights that we have mixed with the fluorescence that were there, and we close the shutters. Kevin wrote that into the script that somebody jammed gum in the locks, and then we don't have to worry about the windows, and that's another color temperature. As we were going on and we were getting closer to starting, it became apparent, like, guys, we don't have a lot of film. Film costs money. You have one or two takes, and you got to get this stuff down. And that, now, like, this whole thing has been filled with, like, one nerve-wracking moment after another. So we start shooting. It was three weeks. We shot 21 days straight. At the time of shooting, Dave was the director of photography, who's also the cameraman. Ed Hapstack would assist Dave. I guess my title would have been best boy, which is head of electrical department is a best boy. He decided that I would record the sound because I'd done it once on a short film. Kevin was the director. This is where we shot the very first footage in Clerks. Yes. We shot the first night we shot right here in the video store. Don't hold it against him. I mean, he just never got Caitlin out of his system. It's not your fault. It's Dante. 
we had about 12 people here. That was the yes. largest day of the shoot. Like to move crates and to, you know, the, to move stuff around. A lot of people crammed in the space. That was just like, holy, it's, we're actually making a movie. And we're setting up and like the last thing they do before like we're about to shoot is like they start listening. I mean, literally I could hear like my blood going through my ears like boom, 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 boom. So you have that coupled with the tension between Marilyn and myself. <laughs> like it was like that was my first scene. I'm like, oh, this is this is not gonna be good. Look, I don't know thing one about chicks, so if you gotta cry or something, I can get out of here. I'm not sad. You're not? So we shot the scene and halfway through the first take, she flubbed the line. I feel like he's been killing time while he tries to get the ball to tell me how he really feels and then he can't even do it. He he has his friend do it for him. And it was beautiful. And I was so happy, and like finally I was like, ah, okay. It was also the one scene in the movie where he has makeup. makeup we had a makeup movie. person. She's in the movie. And oh, look who it is, the fucking human vacuum. Scumbag, what are you doing? She did him up. He looked like a fucking raccoon. He had a real white yeah. face, and he, she put like real dark eyeliner. He looked goth. And then by the end of the movie, we didn't use any makeup. So we shot the scene of Jeff and Marilyn and then concentrated for the rest of the evening on Brian and Lisa when she comes back and they have that very long seven-page conversation. Something I read in the tabloids. You saw it. Very dramatic, I thought. And we only did two takes of that. And it was a great testimony to their performance, you know, that you could, that we held on and that it lasted in the movie. You could have broken it to me gently. You could have started by telling me you had a boyfriend. I mean, I told you I had a girlfriend. I know. I'm sorry, but when we started talking, it was like I forgot I had a boyfriend. And, and it was, uh, it was like, that was the first thing we shot. This is kind of cool. So then when we find out about what the, the shooting schedule is, you know, it's three weeks of nights. Because we are basically shooting the hours when the store was closed. Kevin did say we'd be filming at night, but you just don't think you'd be filming all night. <laughs> Most of my shooting took place from 11 o'clock at night. So maybe about 10, 30, 10, 15, we'd slowly start taking the store apart and getting things ready. Turning off all the freezers and dealing with the one fluorescent bulb that's buzzing. Until about five or six o'clock in the morning. And then by five or so, we'd start breaking down because the store would have to open again at six in the morning. So we would turn on all the refrigeration units and turn on all the electric lights that were buzzing back on and things like that. And this is while I was working. I worked in the mailroom of AT&T. I was a hairstylist. I had been working for a barware manufacturing company. I'd be at work at 7.30 a.m., get off work at 4.30, and be down at the store at 11. So all in all, in that whole week, I think I got about four hours sleep. I was useless at work. Woo, the routine got to be a bit grueling, to say the least. The original script had me tap dancing into the store. For 10 days straight, I shot, and it was like one Saturday night that I was gonna finally be off. I said, I'm slapping on my Wranglers and I'm going out. And I did that goofy little walk. And Kevin was like, oh, no tap dancing. Let's do that. They used my black cat as the cat and clerk. So I was the quote unquote, the cat wrangler. And what was the movie's cat's name? Lennon's Tomb. Lennon's Tomb. I was just wondering if the article was a misprint. I don't know, like a typographical error or something. Making the cat shit. Vinny basically did not let the cat shit all day. When we put the box on the counter for the first take, we were like, this is gonna be it. He's gonna see that box and fucking dump because he's been waiting all day. And he didn't do it, he just walked out of the box and we we're like, oh, we blew so much film trying to get yeah. this cat shit. Second take though, he was a two take wonder, man. We just rolled film and waited for the cat and then finally that fucking magic moment happened. Here's this fucking camera rolling on the cat and he gets up and he gets on his haunches and we're like, yes. <laughs> Did you sell videotapes? Yeah, what are you looking for? Happy Scrappy Hero Pop. Uh, one second. I'm on the phone with the distribution house now. Let me make sure they got it. I knew at some point my mom was going to have to see that Happy Scrappy scene. I remember pulling Kevin aside and being like, dude, is it really necessary? Like, you've got so many titles here. Can we just scale this back a little or just try and make them a little less on the nose? My cut and eight shafts, come clean, come gargling naked sluts. And he said, sure. Takes it, da, 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 da. ready to roll, camera set up, yep, there you go, boom. Action, Kevin adds three titles to the list. Pink Pussy Lips, 
Oh, yeah, and uh, all holes filled with hard cash. A lot of the people that he cast were people that he knew and friends. The one that stands out was my big cameo in the film. Hey, congratulations. I saw the announcement to this paper. That's why I manually masturbate caged animals for artificial insemination. The women that go through every gallon of milk. My girlfriend sucked 37 dicks. In a row? You mentioned this engagement. That's why I'm thinking maybe it's a misprint. There was also a lot of people who, who were cast that just, as like extras, who just didn't show up. Having people play multiple roles. Ooh, Navy SEALs! Do you sell hubcaps for a 72 Pinto hatchback? Ooh, mini truck amazing. Do you have that one with that guy who was in that movie that was out last year? I don't know, since I was about 13. Ed Habstack plays hockey on the roof with the long hair. So, who's gonna pay for these Gatorades? What do you care, you shoe polish smelling motherfucker? I also played the woman that came out of the funeral home. I put on one of my mom's dresses. Could barely get the thing on. That's why my arms were like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I was supposed to play one role in Clerks, which was the, um, the hockey player. How about covering the point? Man, you suck. Then early on in the shoot, I had my beard, Willem Black. On the spot, we sort of transformed him into somebody who was like sort of brain dead. That was Snowball. Why do you call him that? And so we decided I could shave my beard and play the other role. Hey, don't whip your ass any day, pal. And then you talk to yourself down below, which was our only special effect in the movie, Scott talking to Scott. Yeah, you open. No! I remember, like, as we were filming, Walt Flanagan is in, like, every scene as every customer. He had written the Berserker scene for me. And when I read it, I was like, I can't do it. I got, there's no way I'm going to be able to sing. There's no way I'll be able to do it. I'm just not that guy. Ah. I said, I'll go help you behind the scenes. I'll come, I'll hang out and everything. But I'm really not interested in trying to act because I don't think I can do it. Walt became our go-to guy. There were a lot of people we cast in roles that Walt wound up playing that just didn't show up. It just became the running joke, well, we'll let you do it. Quick, so, put on this hat, put on this wig. Uh, pack of cigarettes? This has been going on for 20 minutes now. Cute cat, what's his name? Annoying customer. Fucking dickhead. Using filthy language in front of the customers. You both should be fired. That was that one was more the, the more the hardest one because there was really lines you had to do and I was really nervous to do that one. Well, if you think that's offensive, check this out. Oh. I think you can see her kidneys. Muse never acted before. I was really nervous about being in front of camera. So I gave him the script and he read it and I was like, "What do you think?" He's like, "I don't know if I could do this." And I'm like, "Dude, it's you." That's how I was anyway. But when it came to reading it. Like, and being in front of the camera, like, I just couldn't do it. You know the dude for 10 minutes, he whips his cock out and shows you, you know? He's just a, he's that kind of guy. But here is a dude who was just like, I don't know if I could say these things. I'm like, dude, you do say these things. So it took a month to rehearse with Muse, solo, away from everybody else, to play himself, to kind of teach him to be himself on camera. I wanted everyone to leave, and I'd make everyone else go inside, or if I was inside, I'd make them go outside. Like the dance scene, outside and he's just like well I can't do it with all these people watching so they went inside Dave turns the camera on walks into the to, to the RST and then we play out the scene and nobody was behind the camera you really don't do shit to entertain other people it's to entertain myself so like as soon as like I had an audience it just was really like I, lo like, I just felt really silly doing it for other people and just being like, all right, everyone, get ready. No inch, no inch, you know what I mean? It Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Asian Design Major yourself, Caitlin Bree. Lisa and I kind of bonded, and honestly, I thought she was probably the funniest person I had ever met. One night we were there and we were rehearsing, and I just leaned in and kissed her, you know? So we got together. I kind of had a crush for her as well in the beginning, but I'm, I was such a dork, I had, I had no game to make any type of sort of moves. It became pretty apparent <laughs> what was going on. <sighs> Lisa and I knew each other for three weeks uh, when we decided to get engaged. And I thought it was kind of cool. I was like, wow, that's awesome. We broke the news to Kevin, and Kevin's first reaction was, wow, this is gonna be great publicity. There was one scene where Randall does the big choice video 
and Vincent Pereira plays like this absolutely perfect clerk. Perhaps you need some help finding the rental title of your choice? You work here? Yes, I'm here to serve you. To serve me? Yes. Perhaps you would like to peruse our new... And we just lost that whole scene because the mag was a crappy mag. And, you know, every morning we got into, damn, we got to get this place back into shape before the, you know, the owner comes and sees exactly what's going on here because I don't think they had any idea. The big scene where Brian and I, after the fight, were laying in the piles of Hostess fruitcakes. The owner of the store showed up that morning and she just walked in as we're sitting there laid out in the candy and she just turned and walked back out <laughs> and it was like, uh-oh. We had a really old boom pole. About a weekend, one of the threads stripped. It was busted and we couldn't use it. And so we ultimately took a hockey stick. For the last two weeks of the show, we used a hockey stick for the boom pole. Noise, noise, noise. Smoking weed, smoking weed. Doing coke, drinking beers. Pack our ass, my good man. Time to kick back, drink some beers, and smoke some weed. The big dialogue scene, you know, at the end with Dante, he's pretty sauce, I think, that night. Ed Havstack would go fucking to the bar on the corner and get me a bottle of Blackberry and like a six pack. And I'd have to sit there and drink and get drunk to do it. I don't know, dude, that can't just nice, but I see that Veronica girl doing shit for you all the time. I saw her rubbing your back, fucking come bring your food. The reason I took that line like where Silent Bob finally speaks in the movie. It wasn't planned, it wasn't written in the script like that. That line was always supposed to be Jason's. Um, but he couldn't nail it, and I was just like, you know what, dude, I'm gonna do this line. Don't worry about it. You know, there's a million fine-looking women in the world, dude. They don't all bring you lasagna at work. Most of them just cheat on you. Come on, lead dick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's right. When you come to the end of a project, it may have been shot at night when everybody else is sleeping, but it's like, let's keep doing it. When we were done shooting, it was just go back to your regular life and not worry about it. After we were done shooting, I didn't talk to those guys for like two months. I was just exhausted. And also I was working on other, on other theater things. The shoot ended, and I probably left three, four days after that. I think, you know, Mosher and Kevin may have been like, you know, where are you going? What are you going to go do? So, well, what am I going to do here? I, you know, I shot the movie. There's nothing left for me to do. I was committed to staying on the whole time as an editor. So we wrapped the movie. Maybe Wrapping was really walking from that store to Over the store. to here. It was we a quick wrap. We basically, I mean, we just had to return the equipment to New York and then the, um, the Steam Beck came here, the six play came here to the video store. The Steam Beck sat right there, like at the, at the, the edge counter, of this counter where this, where this file little file cabinet. cabinet is. The Steam Beck sat right there, left very little wiggle room between that outcropping, that little wall, the um, abutment, and, 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 the, and the Steam Beck itself to get behind the counter. So um, that's where we sat, and somehow we were able to wedge a chair in there as well. And then there was film hanging from like these white little th the things in between the video. We would hang like shots that we were gonna put in sequence. But that was really cool, um, seeing the guys in here with piles of film everywhere. The concept of logging footage was sort of, <laughs> it didn't really occur to them. We slept back there. We slept here because there was no real place to sleep at my house because it had been destroyed by the flood. When I was working the afternoon shift at Quick Stop, you'd be here pretty much all day, yeah. chop sake in a way. One of them would be sitting back there editing the film on the Steam Beck in this little store here while the store was open for business or, or overnight. By the time we were done shooting, I had built up this anxiety about the audio, petrified that it was going to be out of sync. You get me slapped with the fine, you argue with the customers, then I have to patch everything up. It would have been absolutely the most devastating thing in the world. I had recorded the sound the way that you're supposed to. I mean, I'd done it to the best of my knowledge, which is not very much. And then to top it all off, you ruined my relationship. I wouldn't even begin to understand how to fix it. And I finally sat down on the Steam Beck. There was definitely like a giant sigh of relief when 
99% of it, there's two shots where there was like a drift, which I'm sure was just because batteries were dying. But other than that, it all basically sunk up. Oh, fuck you! Fuck you, pal! But what a weird time, man. Like, we were in our early 20s, drinking Pink's Infidel, cutting a 16 miller movie in a closet of a video store. Went to rent a movie down at RST. And uh, I went in there, and Kevin and Scott were in there working with that editing machine. And I just remember being like, wow, it's on film. And like, it was just so weird. The editing process on Clerks was pick the best take, because it was a lot of oneers. We would watch the three to four takes, and pretty much, you you know, we would you choose which one we both thought was the best. There wasn't much cut, cutting involved. It was just stringing together. And then we came up with a final cut. And I remember sitting down and watching it on, on the Steam Deck. And that was the first time I watched it straight through. And um, I thought we had something. You know, I thought Kevin really had something there. Kevin asked me if, you know, I wanted to watch Clerks. To me, it was like, wow, this is the most realistic dialogue I've ever heard. Because that's the way we talked. He took components of our life and, like, the way we felt and the way we talked and the conversations we had and just you know, put it onto a screen. I called him the next day and, you know, he asked me, he said, who do you think these people are? He's like, what about Randall? And I said, this sounds weird, but I said, it seems like it's kind of like me. And, and he said, yeah. He's like, you know, it's sort of like loosely based on you. And I mean, it's like a warm, you know, gushy feeling inside, like, wow, somebody, you know, who I love and respect so much would take little pieces of me because he thought I was important enough and he thought I was special enough. My mother's a very famous quote that I'll take with me in my grave. She watched the movie, completed my first completed film, and she went... And you spent $27,000 on this piece of garbage? And I was just like, I yeah. had thought about it that <laughs> way, but, but yeah. Kevin had pretty much extended himself financially through his credit cards to the point where he didn't have enough money. He was only covering his minimums, so he was not paying off his credit card debt. Every month he was getting this incremental interest applied to it, so he owed $30,000. We were working toward the IFFM, the independent feature film market, based on this Amy Taubin article from The Voice. The article kind of talked about the history of the slacker, how it went from being this kind of work in progress at the IFFM, I got noticed by people, cut it out, kept the article, put it in a frame and hung it next to my word processor. But to me it was like, oh, the IFFM, that's what I zoomed in on, I'm like, go to the IFFM and hopefully find people who are interested in your movie. The IFFM, the independent feature film market, its purpose was to showcase as much independent work as uh, possible. We submitted and we got chosen and we were like, woohoo, our movie's gonna show at the Angelica. Like, how massive is that? We got this the last day, Sunday. Sunday at 11 a.m. And we were like, well, that's awesome. We got all week, advertised, it's perfect. That's gotta be primo spot, man. It's like we're gonna build up to that moment, it's gonna be really great. And the IFM right in the corner. There were just people and things set up all over the place. It was like, a, it's just like a circus out, out front. Just, there were people like dancing and in duck suits and diapers and they were advertising our films. We had made all of these different kinds of posters. We had made copies like a billion Chinese couldn't be wrong. Clerks. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have a packed house for our movie, man. It's gonna be awesome, we're gonna see how it plays. The day came, the screening came. Whole cast came. Oh my God, we're gonna get to see ourselves on the big screen. But there was always like people on the sidewalks and people everywhere. Monday through Friday, jam-packed with fucking people. I mean, it was just wall-to-wall -wall people. You could not move around. In the morning that we got there for our screening on the Sunday, there was nobody. As soon as we walked into Angelica, we realized something was wrong. It pretty much looked like it does right now. Nobody there. It was a fucking ghost town. There was nobody Nobody anywhere. at the outside the Angelica. Went downstairs, opened the doors. Empty. Fucking empty barn of a theater. Oh my god, like, where are all the people? Like, holy shit. There was a couple of young people, and there was an old guy in front of us. 
like all week long, we had gone to these like whatever movies that had no more credibility than ours, and they seemed like they were three quarters full all week long. And we realized that we kind of got the shit position. So it, the uh, everything that we were working for that day was I was b fucking crestfallen, like it was we failed. I'm sitting in a very empty movie theater, seeing it up on screen for the first time that big. And finally I'm like, oh my god, everyone keeps cursing. Fuck owe me ten bucks. No, fucking tonight we're gonna rip off this fucker's head, take out his fucking soul. Like, I, it's so filthy. What was I thinking? And like, I spent 28 grand on this. I, I'll never be able to pay that back. We're, we're ruined. <laughs> It was like a reality moment of like, this could be it. That's the only time your movie's going to screen in public, and you will spend the rest of your life going like, that was the best it ever was. Nobody will ever see this movie again. It's, it's grainy, it's black and white, it's people talking. Whoa, we're done with that. Don't have to worry about this anymore. In 1993, I was a consultant to independent filmmakers. I knew that I had to see Clerks. It looked like it could be awful. It had a tacky still, but the whole idea of something set in a convenience store interested me very much. I said, that's a smart idea uh, because my whole feeling about convenience stores is that they are a metaphor for our society today. And I circled it in my schedule, and that was where I was going to be. Why do I have this light? Have some chips, you'll feel better. Well, there were a couple of things that stood out for me in Clerks. Number one was that Kevin could really write dialogue. And what happened after that was that I was walking up the stairs, Peter Roderick was walking down the stairs. I said, I just saw this movie. I think it's wonderful. And you should see it. It's called Clerks. And Bob I'd known for a while, and I really took his recommendation seriously. So I made a point of getting the video cassette out of the library and going and sitting down and watching the film. And I thought it was absolutely great. And so the next day, I was talking to Amy Taubin, who was a really good friend. I was writing for The Village Voice. And I had a column there, and I was covering the market. I had basically nothing to write about because there was nothing much of interest there. I said, Amy, you got to see Clerks. I got a number in Jersey. And I think she spoke to Kevin's mother. And Kevin's mother, if I remember, said, you mean somebody liked my son's movie? So we're all in this, um, this uh, apartment and kind of dejected, and phone rings. He's going, Kevin, my name's Amy Talbin, and, you know, I write for the Village Voice, and I was like, yeah, I, yeah, I know who Amy Talbin is. And I was like, who is this man? Like, quit lying, don't fucking yank my chain. And I said, no, 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 this is Amy Talbin from the Village Voice, and I, I heard your film was great, and I would like to see it. And I was just like, is this really Amy Talbin? I was like, do you know I have the article that you wrote about Richard Linklater framed? She was like, well, this phone call just took a jump. I was just like, who told you this? She was like, well, I'm not at liberty to say, but if you could send me a tape, I, I'm, I might be able to write about it for my IFFM wrap-up. And I think in the column, I transcribed that conversation. Phone rang another hour later, and it was Peter Broderick, who wrote for Filmmaker Magazine. And I knew him because we used that article. I was like, what, Peter Broderick? Like, I was getting called by the Indie All-Stars. Peter Broderick's like, I, you know, I, at, a, at the behest of uh, somebody who I really trust, I went into the video library uh, and watched Clerks, because at the IFFM, you got a screening, you also gave him a tape, so people who couldn't make the screening could watch it in the video library. And I was like, get out of, who is this person, man? He's like, well, you don't know him? And I said, no, and he's like, his name is Bob Hawk. But I do believe there's fate, there's a destiny, so I was, meant to be there. When he finally called the house, I was just like, dude, you, I, I'm in love with you, man. I think it took Kevin about six months to stop calling me 
Mr. Hawk. So Bob Hawk started everything. Bob Hawk had also um, told John Pearson about the movie. Now John Pearson was a legend. If you were an independent filmmaker, there was no producer's rep that you wanted more than John Pearson. A producer's rep is somebody that helps filmmakers sell their movie to distributors in the United States. A good producer's rep not only helps people get into film festivals, helps kind of shape it for the press, but also gets all the distributors to you know see the movie at the right point and then negotiates the deal with them. He had sold uh, Slacker, he had sold Roger and Me, he had sold uh, She's Gotta Have It. Clerks came to me through numerous people, uh, some repute in the community. It included Peter Broderick, Bob Hawk, and Amy Talbot, of course, from the Village Voice. So I sent him a copy. I was away when the tape came in. I remember John was out of town. I remember having this tape to watch in the morning, and I hated watching stuff because um, at this point, we'd been looking at hundreds and hundreds of films for years, and a lot of them were terrible. I mean, we had our office was lined with films. It was just stacked up. There were all, we were always behind. There were always tons of tapes to watch. Thanks. Have a good one. Do you mind if I drink this here? Sure. Go ahead. And put this tape in, and it's black and white tape, and I don't know anything about it. And I'm watching it, and I'm feeling kind of drowsy. And, and then I just found myself really laughing. And I even wound the tape back to like, did I hear what I just thought I heard? And sort of, you know, like it really woke me up, you know? And I, I just loved it. Now, interestingly enough, th this was the year that John had announced to any and all that he was through being a producer's rep. He had it, he was tired of it. So then I guess John comes back and I remember, I mean, I, I distinctly told him. If you're gonna, you know, stop uh, repping movies, then you better not watch this. John Pearson calling. Isn't this interesting? I'm getting back to yesterday's calls when I wasn't around, and there were three Kevins who called in a row, being number one in my book in more ways than one. And uh, I look forward to talking to you about Clerks, which I've seen twice. Okay, bye. And the phone call was pretty much this, truncated. Watch the movie. think it's really funny, man. Don't think the audience for this movie exists yet. So I don't know if there's a marketplace for it. But if you're ever in the city, I'm happy to buy you lunch. And I was just like, oh man. It wasn't like better luck next time. It wasn't quite like that, but it was sort of, it was sort of like, you know, um, you know, sort of, it was sort of like, well, that's, that's it for now. <laughs> We're putting you on the stack. <laughs> so that was it. You know, Pearson's call kind of put the nail in the coffin and all this interest was just gonna die. Kevin. John Pearson, Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock. Um, I, I, I watched your film yet again today. Um, this must mean something. <clears throat> I'm hooked. I'm an addict. What can I tell you? All I know is that for a week, you know, I just, uh, I just watched a lot. I watched Clerks a lot. You know, I'd had, I'd reevaluated. But I probably called and said, uh, you know, I guess, I guess, I guess it's inevitable. We're, we're, eventually we're going to do this, so let's just, let's just, let's get, let's get cooking. It's fucking huge. In the original, Dante is shot, dead at the end. I don't even ask any. I don't even say anything. I think my name is like Quiet Man. If you look at look in the uh, in the credit, it says Quiet Man. So I go in and I shoot Dante, and uh, yeah. The movie's kind of for me. It was always structurally based on do the right thing, which happens over the course of the day. It's very funny, but then something very serious happens at the end, and the movie concludes. I hated it. Hated it. Hated it. Hated it. Hated it. I kind of like, what? This, oh, no. And after falling in love with the film and then having this in the last few <laughs> seconds of the film, one of the things I had to say right away is that I said, you can't kill Dante at the end. That has to go. <laughs> Kevin, John Pearson, Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock. Um, I have an idea for you. Please call me. Bye. Pearson was the guy that really brought it all home. Pearson was just like, look, you got to lop that ending off. 
You can't kill him at you the can't. end. He's like, you kill the dude at the end for no better reason than you just don't know how to end your movie. I'm proud to say I might not have been the first to um, think it, but it's since I was the first person to say, look, we got a, this ending's a problem. So he's like, you can just end it without that. End it when his friend, when Randall leaves the store. You're closed. <laughs> It was in Amy Taubin's column that it really came to my attention, like, oh, I should really chase this one down. Mark Tusk was a key person in the Miramax Acquisitions Department. He was like the cool guy. He was the one who was most on the edge, most in touch with sort of the most exciting and different things that were happening. Miramax was like pie in the sky. It was like Sundance to us. It was like, pfft. I got a fax. It's on Miramax letterhead that said, I've been hearing great things about your movie, read about it in the Village Voice, really would love to see a copy of it. I looked at the tape, smoked a joint, <laughs> and uh, after the you know, initial bumpy first reel, you know, I actually found that the movie you know, really you know, was well written and very funny and um, pretty uh, ingenious use of a static set. My job title was uh, Assistant Harvey Weinstein. Mark at the time, I think, was trying to rally support for the film. Rounded up a bunch of friends, my brother, a few Miramax uh, executives and, um, you know, more youthful staff. And Mark had set the screening up in order to show Harvey how the movie played with an audience. Harvey, of course, was not the Harvey he is today. You know, now Harvey is, is synonymous with film in general, not just indie film. But, you know, I knew he was the head of Miramax. Him and his brother ran Miramax. Harvey Weinstein was at the screening, uh, Treya, who was head of acquisitions at the time. A 16 millimeter screening, and again, in the screening room there in the Tribeca Film Building. Harvey, of course, was a uh, avid cigarette smoker. $53 a week on cigarettes, come on! Would you give somebody that much money each week to kill you? And so I'm not sure that the, anti the smoking tirade at the beginning of the movie really uh, drew him into it. The good news was great. All the young Miramaxers loved the movie. I loved it. I mean, for me at that time, I was 23 years old, so that movie was speaking directly to me. But it was trumped by the bad news that, like, except Harvey walked out in 15 minutes. He left 10, 11 minutes into the movie. After that screening, I remember everybody came upstairs, and the decision was not to acquire the film. You know, it's a pass. I was totally deflated. I was, I was deflated in the sense that I saw something that really got to me. I saw something that I would watch over and over again. We were dead. Like, we were not going to be picked up. There was going to be no distribution for the movie because none of the distributors were biting. I was on the advisory selection committee of the Sundance Film Festival, and so I had already told them, oh, I saw this film, Clerks, you, it, it's something you all have to see. He used to send me lists of movies that he thought should be in Sundance, and we'd, we'd say, that's great, let's look at them again and make sure they were brought to our attention and stuff like that. The selection process at Sundance is a mystery to a lot of people. But, but ultimately the decision ends up with me. I was very much taken by the film, but I had some hesitances about it. And part of my hesitances had to do with the sensibilities of the film. I'm gonna be sick. You just fucked a total stranger. Shut the fuck up. But I knew that the women in the office, and there were at least two of them that, 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 that spoke of this, would find at least part of the work to be objectionable. And they did. It's sexist. Don't. Because there's a stranger in a bathroom, he just raped Caitlyn. Oh, she God. said she did all the work. Will you shut the fuck up? There was a problem. It was for a while rather iffy whether clerks will get into Sundance or not. And I remember working here at the store and Bob was calling me from Los Angeles going like, it's not written in stone. And I remember very much having that debate. You know, is it something that, you know, we should really be showing? For me, the answer was yes, not for everybody on my staff. Two hours later, he called back and he goes, it's done, you're in. And I was just like, By the 1994 Sundance Fest, it had become a major positioning event for the majority of American independent films that were going to get out there into the marketplace. I thought that uh, Clerks being invited to Sundance very much boosted its prospects. I remember we went out to Sundance. You know, Lisa and I went and Brian went. I think everybody pretty much went out there. 
I think that Bob wrote a genius program note. The filmic equivalent of a garage band, this low, no budget movie chronicling a day in the life of a convenience store clerk is a smart, funny, insightful wail of ennui. The idea of the audience for clerks was always going to be a huge question mark until it actually played for some. At the IFFM, we only saw it screened to a handful of people. It was like at Sundance, the first night, like I remember walking into the theater and seeing that the theater sat like 300 people. It was like nerve, 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 nerve wracking. It went religiously. Everyone laughed loud and long at all the right times and all the right places. Lines were lost in the laughter. It felt great. It felt that even if we never got picked up, the $27,000 was worth it alone. All in all, an excellent day. Thank you, God. Second screening, which was at the, uh, the Park City Library Center, there were some members of the press in attendance. Still not so many distributors. The Library Center had more time for the Q&A afterwards. <laughs> that was Kevin knocking me and I think everybody else off their feet. We just basically fed the cat and didn't let him go near a box. About, that's why I don't see that like no animals were harmed thing because <laughs> that cat was bound, man. That cat was bound up. People who had seen the first two shows and had now written about it, filed something about it, that, sh that stuff was getting into print. The trade reviews, fabulous. Variety gave us a great review. The New York Times wrote about it. Dave Kerr wrote about it in the Daily News. And it was like, it's David Mamet meets Howard Stern. It's been great. It's been really nice because you, you screen. We had two really good screenings and like people will find you or see you on the street and just say, well, the clerics liked it. People were already actually coming up to me and saying, hey, you know, loved you. It was great. Clerks was great. Loved you in it. I was like, thank you. We had a couple of casting directors just approach us. Um, they want a picture resume. <laughs> Where to start? There's so much going on. So like Kennedy from MTV at, at the time wanted to interview me. I was like, oh my god. I, that, that was totally just weird. Now like the wait lines for the movie, like people who are standby were really long. People were trying to jam in to see the flick. It became real a buzz flick. There was a little bit of, you know, you can feel the momentum, certainly from other people talking about the film. I think Mark Tuss then redoubled his own relentless quest to bring Clerks in, in, into the fold at Miramax. We're still uh, looking to get a distributor for Clerks. Yeah, we're still looking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one more screen. Egyptian. Four o'clock right before reality bites, so if you don't have tickets for reality bites, you can come to Clerks, stay in the seats, <laughs> just get it to reality. By the time it came to the last screening at Sundance, a real buzz had built up about the movie. Tusk was like using all that, using these articles to get Harvey to come to the last screening. Word had gotten to Harvey or we had, you know, reiterated that, well, Clerks is one that we should really, you know, consider again. And, and then everything was gearing up uh, for this Friday, for the distributors to be there, for Harvey and the Miramax team to come back. When I went to Sundance, I was still Harvey's assistant. He said to me, so what do you like? And I said, well, I really like this film, Clerks. And he said, well, why do you like it? And I spoke to all of the reasons why I really responded to it. You know, just telling that, like, that, that I found the humor and the, the, the questions that the characters were dealing with and the, the life questions the characters were dealing with were stuff that I could relate to and I know my friends could certainly relate to. Oh, I hate this fucking place. Then quit. You should be going to school anyway. Please, Veronica. The last thing I need at this point is a lecture. And I remember towards the end of it, he was saying, okay, well, I'm going to go see this movie play with an audience. I'm going to go see a lot of people are liking this movie. I'm going to go see it play with an audience. Okay, guys, so how's it been going? Great, we just great. had like a killer interviews today. Is this the last screening today? And there's today? a great piece in the New York Times today. Yeah. Uh, I had yeah. a great review in the Hollywood Reporter. So it's been a great day. Okay, good. So this is the last screening? Yeah, final screening. Okay, all right, well, good luck. I'll catch up with you later. You get to that Friday show at the Egyptian. There was a lot riding. If you want to talk about dire circumstances, it was do or die. Three or four minutes before it was supposed to start, and being in this packed theater, and sure enough, Harvey walks in. 
and he's walking down the aisle and you just hear like it got quiet and then there was like a little buzz like Harvey's here, Harvey's here, Harvey's here. We ended up, you know, being pushed into a, th a screening event in a movie theater and Tusk, you know, I think was sitting on one side of me and I think he put somebody else on the other side. I couldn't leave. To introduce the film to you with great pleasure, Kevin Smith. With me, my producer, Scott Moser. Um, it was a really nice intro, but uh, the rags part, I believe, the riches have not come. So we're still waiting. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It's, it's, this is our last screening, so this is, means a lot to us. And uh, We've had a great time, so it's been a great eight days thus far. We've still got two more to go. The food's been free, you can't ask for anything more. Um, We've gotten some great press. The interesting thing I heard, though, is the convenience store news just called today and wanted to do a cover story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, afterwards, we're going to bring up the actors. You can meet the people who are involved and the tech crew and stuff like that. But while I'm here, I just want to thank a few people. Mr. Gilmore, of course, uh, Bob Hawk, kind of our angel, John Pearson. Anyone else I might have forgotten, forgotten. So uh, that, that's it. Let's go and enjoy, please. Friends, let me tell you about another group of hate mongers that were just following orders. Who's that? They were called Nazis. Nazis. Yeah, that's right. They a Nazi. Harvey was squirming again in the first ten minutes of the movie. At which point I was like, kind of like, you know, I nudged him and said. 37. Tusk yanked him back down the seat and was just like, you just sit here and think 37. Until you hear the word, you know, number 37, you can't leave yet. 37. I'm 37? I'm going to class. Oh my god. Once the 37 scene kicked in, there was one dude who was boisterously laughing throughout the flick, like, like Bob De Niro in Cape Fear, you know, where he's like, ah, ha, 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 you know, just really laughing loud, loudest in the theater. We're like, who the fuck is that, man? What an annoying laugh. So distracting, it's Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Soon enough, you know, he was laughing uproariously, probably louder than most people in the theater. So you could literally hear him in the, in the movie theater, you could. It was great. And hearing it was just like, wow, wow. The crowd eats it up. There is louder, longer laughter than in any of the previous screenings. When Silent Bob delivers his single line, there are cheers and claps. It ends, big fucking applause. I get up, bring the cast with me, we do a bit of Q&A. Oh, nice. <laughs> Harvey exited the far right door of the Egyptian theater as the throngs were coming out. He came out of the theater, he picked his head up and he went like that. Went to a place across the street from the Egyptian. Tusk and Harvey lined up across the street. No, it's the, the eating establishment. The eating establishment. I mean, from the moment you heard it, it was like something's happening. Like something's happening that we can't understand or contemplate because we've never been in these circumstances, but something's happening. That was where we had our first sit down with Harvey Weinstein. Uh, we ordered some uh, potato skins with bacon. He was both going to eat <laughs> and sign off on, it, on, the, on the fundamental terms of the deal at the same time. Buy the movie on the spot, I mean, and just make a deal with him over potato skins and french fries in some Sundance restaurant. But I was in the room, I was in the same large room in this, in this restaurant, and I knew what was going on, and I, just, and I couldn't wait to find out. Harvey did his, you know, song and dance as far as how much he loved the movie. They all liked it. Yeah. You, know, you know, it was me who was just being, you know, stupid. I mean, the rest of them, you know, were totally into it. John loved it, Tuss loved it. I mean, all the cool people at Miramax, it was just the old fart, couldn't get his head around it. And then I went to see it at that screening in Sundance and flipped. He was just like, fucking love the movie. You think it's really fucking funny. We can take this fucking movie, blow it out in fucking beers, put a fucking soundtrack on it, take this movie to the fucking world. And me and him were like, fuck it. Man. And it taught me a lesson not to walk out of movies. By this point, everybody knew it cost 27,000 bucks. A really fair advance on this would be 
a couple of hundred thousand plus let's throw in the 27 for what actually got spent on the film. Let's make it 227 and just make it simple and sweet. John Pearson was like, all right, let's go talk about it. So he pulled me and Scott to the side and he was like, all right, this is the moment. We all um, know why, we, why we're here and we know we didn't get into this to make money. Like, I think I speak for you guys when I'm saying it doesn't matter how much they're offering us. He's going, I think what they're offering us is fine. I really don't think we should push him and ask for more. I was like, dude, I don't give a shit about money. I was just like, I want to see Miramax at the head of this film. Like, yeah. That would be fucking phenomenal. I don't give a shit if they give us no money. It's really thanks to Mark Tusk, I mean, and his incredible persistence, that the rest is history. I'm buying this movie. Harvey signed off on the deal. Harvey was like, excellent to meet you. Can't wait to work with you. And he was gone. And right. Tusk the whole time was sitting there. And we would look at Tusk, and Tusk was just like, and we were like, what seemed almost impossible actually came to pass. Miramax bought clerks. And uh, he actually called us late one night. I couldn't believe it. He said, Miramax bought it. And I was like, oh, you know, you're, you're not kidding now, are you or anything? And he, I mean, to us, the family realm itself, that was like millions of dollars. And uh, he said, I get to pay off my debts. That's the first thing he said. It made him really happy, you know. It wasn't just the experience of having the movie bought and like, okay, the movie's bought and at some point it's going to come out in the theater. It's like, the movie was bought and then it was like we were pulled into, you know, it's like we were put on a magic carpet and sent off into the air. You know, like I was, it was two years later when I was 22 years old um, that I was able to, with Kevin's help, I was able to make a better place. You know, with his funding, I was able to direct a better place. I remember when, uh, when Clerks, uh, he came back from, from uh, selling Clerks, he goes, you know, I'm gonna buy a comic book store, and I want you to run it. He told me I could make a movie with a budget that was, you know, uh, funded partially by Miramax, a deal that he had with Miramax at the time, and, you know, partially with his own money. We eventually made it, and eventually did show at the Angelica, and it was uh, vulgar. He's always said that his friends were, you know, a big part of why he is who he is today. You know, it has like sort of a cumulative snowball effect where, you know, like your, your world's just kind of have expanded and, you know, for the better. And, and you're, just, you're just happy that you met each other. I mean, there are still people who are seeing clerks for the first time. And it's like a revelation to them. I talk to people who had hardly been born when Clerks opened, who are now in their teens, who talk about Clerks as if it's, it's something f fresh and, and new and important to them. Like, you just can't get away. You know, it's 10 years later and we're still in the store at three in the morning. Yep. Um, which ain't necessarily a bad thing, you know? It's just, it's the cradle of civilization, really, for me. So it's kind of like ironic that here we are, so late, still talking about this movie in the, in the same place we shot the movie. Would you like to suck my cock berserker? Bye.